What's up, everybody? Welcome to Professor T's Shaha Ha Worship um, Ministry. We're going to share with you today and probably multiple installations the prodigal son. Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in the book Beyond Orion's Gate, um, your part in the war behind all wars, written by Mark Finley. Uh, he tells this story about a man who has uh, been in prison for robbery and murder, and he was sentenced to death by the electric chair. Now, while in jail waiting for his execution, uh, he was given the Bible to read, which he did reluctantly and out of boredom. It had a change in effect on him, and uh, he became immersed in the Bible. He records his spiritual journey. Um, Sam writes, he says, I found a place where a man named Jesus sent some of his gang to bring him a mule. For this, I thought, Jesus, he's a horse thief. Then I ran across a place where he made wine. For this, I called him a bootlegger. And then I found a place where he raised the dead, healed all men of sickness, cast out evil. Now I wondered what manner of man is this? So I started at Matthew and I read all the part called the New Testament. And by the time I found him, not a horse thief, not a bootlegger, but the Son of God. I knew of people who prayed and served that God and who lived up to his law, but that wasn't me. I was a convict on death row, a murderer. But I read where people in the Bible were also outside of the law. Then I was troubled. I wanted a peace of mind that this God was given away, but how do I get it? How do I get word to God? Can he really hear you when you pray? And will he answer you when you pray, when you've never heard of him? So I tried my prayers. My prayers never got out of my cell. I prayed for help, but I hung on to the word with both hands. I decided to give it one more try. For three days, there was no more miserable soul than I was on earth. I prayed, I cried, I pride, cried more and longer. And, and the more miserable I became, the more I prayed. On November the 4th, I made one more try to reach the God who could give me that peace of mind. I got out of, out of my bed, on my knees, and truly confessed every wrong I could think of, and I asked God to please help me. I told him if I had forgotten any of my sins to have mercy on me and add them to the list because I was guilty of them too. Let me tell you, I never had such a wonderful feeling in my life. I wanted to shout it out to the world. Yes, I felt the Spirit of God had truly brought his love into my heart. After I settled down in bed, alone about Mount morning, I slept peacefully for the first time in my adult life. The next morning, I got up. I prayed before I even put on my clothes. That day, I testified to my fellow men and comrades here. I am in a cell on death row, but I am more free here than I ever was in the streets. I have no fear of death whatsoever. To me, death is one step closer to my Jesus. I can truly say there is no sin too black that Jesus' blood cannot cover. Christ can wash it white as snow no matter what your sin is. So this story is adapted from, extrapolated from the prodigal son. 
And it's interesting to note that when he was asking his father for his resources, his inheritance, the purpose of his will is active. No advice can thwart the younger son's determination. Now, in this parable, God accedes to the son's demand. There are no checks of conscience. This is the final gulf. Apostasy of heart precedes apostasy of life. And inward grief and outward sorrow ensue. So at last, this prodigal son was free. The old restrictions that fettered his childhood and youth, they were thrown off. All the time he had to go to church, these many years, they were just cast aside. He was his own master and the world was at his feet. From city to city, country to country, he makes his way. He has no plans. This is part of his emancipation. He's broken out of the old prison of duties. The father's house uh, built on purity, self-sacrifice, love, service. It grows dimmer against the horizons of his new world view. His zeitgeist. His milieu. So the purpose of his will is active. No advice can thwart his determination. Nothing's going to stop. I want to say to you, when we make choices, the frontal lobe is the central to the formation of plans and the organism's ability to guide its behavior by internalized goals and objectives. It all starts in the frontal lobe when we make choices. We'll talk about that a little bit more, how the, the lower brain, the limbic system, uh, is influences choices. However, when we're under stress, so during stress and other emotional outbursts, yelling, screaming, tantrum, rage, psychotic breaks, the lower brain functions are continually able to shut down the higher brain functions. So when we're yelling and screaming and cussing, when we have rage, when we have massive anger issues, our lower brain is shutting down the frontal lobe. So when the mother's eye is no longer on the prodigal son, he plunges into filthy debauchery. I would like to suggest that there is always famine in this land of forgetfulness of God, the unsatisfied hunger of the heart, it dogs godless life. Uh, living too often, it leads to a deeper, a deeper degradation and closer entanglement with low satisfaction. We're talking about the virtue of vice, the virtue of vice. Men madly plunge deeper into the mud in search of finding the pearl that has eluded them, says the poet. The precious years of life, the strength of intellect, the bright visions of youth, the spiritual aspirations, all are consumed in the fires of lust. Says the poet, such is the world's gay garish feast. In her first charming bowl, infusing all that fires the breast and cheats the unstable soul. It comes to an end. And this type of want often comes in the midst of many earthly possessions, no matter how much bling bling you have. You cannot fill the void, the vacuum, the chasms, the emptiness of your heart. When vanity like a blight falls upon the soul, he began to be in want, not only because he didn't have no food, but because of the famine of his heart, of his soul. And instead of plenty in the father's house, the prodigal has poverty. 
the state of freedom, he's now in bondage. In place of honor as a son, he now has shame. One poet exclaimed on that hard Roman world, disgust, secret loathing, deep fell, deep weariness and sated lust make human life a living hell. Now, this is what a healthy brain looked like on the underside. Um, notice how smooth it looks. The Greek word for character, from which we get the word character, literally means to impress, marking, or engraving, or grooves uh, in the brain. Modern psychology and brain science support this general concept of grooving and engraving that distinguishes or characterizes an individual. Science explains it in terms of nerve pathways. Uh, which acts are repeatedly modify themselves and facilitate the carrying of these little electrical impulses. Um, this is the brain of a person, uh, Dr. Daniel Amen. He's 18, um, three year history, uh, four times a week of smoking marijuana. Now, these holes don't mean they're literally holes in your brain from marijuana. What it does mean is that there is no blood circulation, no electrical transmissions occurring there. So these areas are, for all intended purposes, inactive and dormant. This is what marijuana does to your brain. Um, this is marijuana brain of a 28-year-old, mostly on weekends. And look at the undersurface, the view decreased. Um, the prefrontal lobe cortex and the temporal lobe. So these are not literal holes in your brain from doing marijuana or alcohol or coke or crack, but it is showing that there's no circulation, no electrical activity there, no transmissions, no neurotransmitters are working in that area. And so uh, when they say marijuana doesn't hurt, they are actually not telling you the truth. Uh, this is what uh, alcohol does to a 30 year old. 17 years of heavy weekend use. Look at the look at this. The diminished, the decreased, the compromised uh, cognitive activity. Look at the diminished activity. It means that those neurotransmitters are not firing. This is a uh, alcohol slide too. Uh, uh, 38 year old heavy weekend one. Look at this cone shape means that the brain is not having any circulation there. No electrical transmission. This is a heroin brain. Uh, age 20, 39, 25 years of frequent use. And the frontal surface is marked by the decreased activity. Look at this heroin brain. And some are saying that um, it changes and damages your brain forever. So a study at the California University found that cocaine addiction plus cigarettes use decrease your blood flow to the brain by 45%. Cocaine addiction plus cigarettes decrease your blood flow by 45%. The biochemical process that intervenes in the brain function is so precise and delicate that substances that we ingest, aspirate, or receive by injection may change the function of your brain and damage it. This is what it's like to worry. Uh, you can see this added ex, uh, ex circulation here electrical impulses here. Um, it, it means you wear it all the time. And that is not healthy for us. Um, one writer says, you need not despair if you want to be right with God. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. It is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of 
choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. And I will break this down for you a little later. But in essence, it says uh, boutons are at the end of the transmitting fibers that look like boutons, a booting, a button in the French. They help a message bridge the synaptic junction when a particular sending fiber is repeatedly stimulated. The stimulation causes more boutons to be formed, making it easier, increasingly easier for the message to flow along a particular pathway and to uh, perform an action. And boutons secrete various chemicals. One such chemical is, is acetylene, a chemical used in a tiny gap between the bouton and the next cell, stimulating the cell and sending the message on down the pathway, down the nerve line. So connecting this to a biblical integrated interdisciplinary approach, multidisciplinary approach. So in Luke 15, verse 15, the young man has no money. He doesn't have a single friend to help him. In dire need, he scoured the city, streets, and the countryside for employment, but all he could find was the lowly job of feeding pigs. It tells me that there were men in that city where he was who were completely adjusted to a life apart from God. Secularism, progressivism, liberalism, every ism is a deviation from the norm. The Greek word for attach or glued is ekalethe. Uh, it is the aorist middle voice. He glued himself. The transliteration, the thought, the conveyance, the construence is the man did not want to hire this Jewish boy. Hence, the labor he assigned him. Feed him pigs. Sin makes men companion of swine in more ways than one. The godless world is a hard taskmaster and every and very odious for his bondsmen. Uh, unclean animals are companions for one who is holy without God. Thomas Hibbs, a professor of philosophy some time ago at Boston College, he defined uh, nihilism, a nihilism, the state of spiritual impoverishment and shrunken aspiration and the growing sense that no religion or moral code is credible. And so uh, we can see this today in many of our communities, uh, the devaluing of life, the extinguishing of life, the sacrificing of life almost. The subsequent spiritual impoverishment, says Dr. Thomas, it leads the human spirit to one of two places, to despair or to creative boldness. The latter of which found expression in the Columbine killers, the creative boldness, according to him, results when a person declares independence from outmoded norm, values, ethos, mores, and considers himself, you see, transcending these or such norms that are antiquated. Uh, in the thought of the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, this means they saw themselves as being good and evil, which Dylan Klebold echoed when he said on the video, we've evolved into one step of being human. We are so godlike, we have self-awareness. But the Bible says in Luke 15, 16, um, the only companions that the prodigal son had were swine. And the swine were happy they got what they wanted. They talk about it as the down grace of sin or steep and short. Swine were cared for. The prodigal son was left to care for himself. He was alone. And extreme hardship induced reflection and introspection and retrospection. Now, faith is natural, or filth, rather, is natural to swine. 
shameful to him and the pigs are better off than he is. Not only is this prodigal son feeding swine, but feeding himself with swine's food. The unsatisfying food that is offered to the starving souls of men by the devil. His employer makes him feel that the swine are more valuable than he is. Notice in Luke 15, 17, the striking, riveting, poignant, salient, cogent expression. He came to himself of the return of consciousness. Wretchedness stirred reason. There's no sign that this young man conscious smote him or his heart woke in love to the father's heart. His hunger and his physiological hunger and it only urged this young man to go home, to go home. Philip Yancey in this wonderful book, A Runaway Girl from Travis City, writes this statement. Her parents a bit old fashioned, tend to overreact to her ringing in her nose. The music she listens to and the length of her skirt, they browned her a few times and she sees inside. I hate you, I hate you, she screams at her father when he knocks on the door of her room after an argument. But that night she makes up a plan, she acts on a plan, she has mentally rehearsed, scores of times she runs away. Her second day in Detroit, she meet a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, buys her lunch, arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all alone, she decides. Her parents, they were keeping her from all of the fun. The good life comes or continues for a month, two months, a year. Uh, and the man with the big cigar, she calls them balls. Teaches her a few things that men like. And since she's underage, men pay a premium for her. Occasionally, she thinks about the folks back home, but their lives now seem so boring and so provincial that she can hardly believe it. After a year, the first sallow, the sign of illness appear, and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days, we can't mess around, he growls, and before she knows it, she's out on the streets without a penny to her name. She can turn a few tricks, a couple tricks a night, but they don't pay much, and money goes to support her habits, you see. When winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on the metal grates outside the big department stores. And sleeping is really the wrong word. A teenager girl at night in downtown Detroit can never relax her guard. Dark bands circle her eyes. Her cough worsens. Her pockets are empty. She's hungry. She needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight underneath her and shivers in the newspaper she piled up at, at the top of her coat. Something chokes this synapse of memory and a single image fills her mind of May and Travis City when all the million cherry blossoms at once with her golden retriever dashing through the rows and rows of blossom trees. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up with the, without leaving a message. The first two times, but the third time she says, Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way and, and it'll get there about midnight tomorrow. And if you're not there, I will just stay on the bus until it takes me to Canada. When the bus finally rolls into the station, the air brakes are hissing, the driver announced in this crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, 15 minutes to decide 
her life. She checks herself in a compact mirror, smooths her hair. She licks the lipstick of her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingerprints and wonders if her parents will notice. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. Not one of the thousand scenes that are played out in her mind prepare her for what she saw. There in the concrete walls and plastic chairs in the bus terminal of Travis City, she find a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and grandmother, et cetera, et cetera. Now in the middle of the brain, uh, we have a storage of our emotions similar to filing thousands of CDs. Each CD has stored on it all the memories of a certain type. And this area is often called the limbic system. In the case, of the teenager from Travis City, Michigan. All the incidents of when a father had talked to her about her pop culture habits were stored, so to speak, on the same CD. And when he would speak to her again, she would have a flashback of other unpleasant memories from the past. As she ruminated on these negative experiences, the brain would produce these identical chemicals associated with the original unpleasant experience, cortisol, stress hormone. Kelly Simpson states that when you are emotionally triggered because of one event, one person, you will remember many other past similar events. The trigger events cause the whole CD to come up with all its information on similar past events. You may even feel flooded with emotions, even though by itself the trigger event is not a big deal. She was wounded. On our journey to healing, we're not just talking about a teenager from Travis City, Michigan. Her journey is a parable of your journey and mine. The detail of the scripts may differ a little bit, but the journey is the same that we all have to make. In the end, we all have to fundamentally decide if we want to come home to God and God alone. One poet says the breaking assailant is not always a robber, not always a disease. Sometimes we are wounded by huge disappointments. Body untouched, but your heart is broken. There are broken hearts along this road. Many of us are wounded like birds with broken wings. We've lost our aspiration, bereft of ambition. Many of us grieve as if we've been beaten to the ground and we've lost our strength and our inclination to soar like birds. Broken hopes, broken bodies, broken hearts, broken wills, ermine, children, lost and lone are we. We all been mauled by the devil. devil Either we lie in pathetic impotence or we painfully crawl along against the terrible odds of bereavement today. The poet continues, blind men sit in darkness by the wayside. Cripples drag their main bodies wearily along. Beggars grovel in their sores and their wretchedness. We all turn to the face, to the bright light that breaks over the dark valley. The one who stands with outstretched arms and loving smile named Jesus waiting to perform a heart surgery, heart healing today. A story from Ernest Hemingway will suffice to close this installation. He tells the story of, of a father, a Spanish father who decides to reconcile with his son who had run away to Madrid after a misunderstanding. Now he's remorseful the father takes out his ad in a liberal newspaper, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. Now, Papa, or Paco is a common name in Spain, and when the father goes to the square, he finds 800 young men named Paco waiting for their father. All is forgiven. 800 responded. Forgiveness is the first step of heart turning. Malachi 4, 5, and 6 
speaks to the father, turning their hearts to the children and the children to the fathers. 800 young men were waiting for a healing moment with their father to forgive them. And it was a forgiving time. And forgiveness clears the way, clears the path for love to get through. Forgiveness clears the path for love to get through. Do you love God today? Do you want to come home? Nothing can fill the void, the vacuum in your heart, but the love of God. I pray today you come home. Put a note in the description below. Make a comment. Father God, sometimes you take our vice and turn it into virtue. And sometimes you take our virtue and allow us to transpose them into vices to save us. Because you want to bring us home. Bring us home. We thank you. Lord, we love you. We praise your name. Amen.